The Middleborough Historical Museum is located on Jackson Street in downtown Middleborough, Massachusetts, about six miles east of the Old Colony History Museum. This old colony town was settled by Europeans in 1661 and was officially incorporated as Middleborough in 1669. Today, it is home to a number of historic sites and museums. The Middleborough Historical Association maintains and interprets the history of seven buildings that make up the museum's campus. The two mill workers' homes are original to the site and were the museum's first permanent home, officially opening in 1961. The five other buildings were moved to or built on the site between 1965 and 1980. Within these buildings, extensive collections are on view, and we're excited to share this peek inside. Good afternoon and welcome to the Middleborough Historical Museum, run by the Middleborough Historical Association. My name is Daniel Thompson. I am the president of the Middleborough Historical Association and your guide for today. The museum has been here for over 60 years, um, and the buildings that we see here were mill houses that were built by Colonel Peter Pierce for his workers. Colonel Peter Pierce was a prominent businessman here in Middleborough. Colonel Peter Pierce lived in the home that you see across the street over there of uh, North Main Street. A uh, very beautiful, well-kept home that fortunately was saved from being torn down and a gas station being built there. The white building that you see behind us here was the Colonel Peter Pierce General Store and the upstairs room was used for a lot of um, gatherings and meetings it could hold up to 200 people there were several other mill houses that continued on down the road however they were torn down due to be demolished in the uh, 1950s late 1950s however these two were saved thanks to lawrence romain who uh, approached the town and the um, Historical Association was then able to purchase these buildings to be the core of the museum. We are now inside Millhouse One. This building, built in the 1820s, was actually a duplex uh, for two families. It was a two family home, one on each side. Uh, we're in the room that was the living room and is the reception room for the museum now. We are now in what is referred to as the Tom Thumb Room. Our museum is very often referred to by people as the Tom Thumb Museum because that's what we're known for. Here uh, in uh, these three rooms, we have information about uh, Lavinia, Mercy Lavinia Warren Bump, who was married to General Tom Thumb, Charles Sherwood Stratton from Bridgeport, Connecticut. They were the world's first superstar entertainers uh, recognized worldwide, particularly because of a three-year world tour that they took in 1869. They worked for P.T. Barnum. Uh, Barnum had discovered um, Charles Sherwood Stratton in uh, Ridgeport, Connecticut, um, and took him on as an entertainer. Both Tom and Lavinia had what was called proportionate dwarfism. They were little people, but they were perfect in form. As you can see here, the cutout is an actual life-size cutout of them at their wedding, which was the, um, the social event of 1863 that even included a, a reception at the White House with Abraham and Mary Lincoln. In uh, one of the rooms over here, we have uh, what we refer to as the bump room, looking at Lavinia and her family. Lavinia's sister, known as Minnie, also was a little person, but she had four full-size brothers, two full-size sisters, and her parents were full-size as well. And on their world tour, 
As they traveled, they visited many foreign dignitaries, including the Emperor of Japan, Queen Victoria, who they'd seen before, particularly Tom on different occasions, who introduced him to the other crown heads of Europe. And they truly became worldwide entertainers. Um, contrary to popular belief and to uh, what we commonly hear, they were not circus performers. Um, the circus was P.T. Barnum's retirement project in the 1870s, and Tom and Lavinia had been married and around the world and so forth long before that as entertainers. Singing, dancing, Tom liked to do impersonations, particularly of, of Napoleon. Uh, so some of the gifts they received are in that room. We also have artifacts from um, examples of their clothing, home furnishings, and then after Tom's death in 1883, uh, at the age of 45, Lavinia marries Count Primo Magri, another little person, and they continue their entertainment um, and living here in Middleborough, where um, eventually both of them pass away um, in 1919 and 1920. thing that uh, Lavinia wanted as an entertainer was she hoped to be remembered. So for example, one of the things that she did, there was is a portrait over here on the wall that shows um, Lavinia later in her life and that uh, she presented to the town in hopes of being remembered. And that's truly what she wanted. She hoped for something like this for her family and for Tom and Count Margaret all to be remembered. Um, and that's one of our missions here at the Nova Historic Association. We're now in the Judge Peter Oliver room here at the museum. And Judge Peter Oliver um, was a judge and businessman here in Middleborough, uh, originally born in Boston, but settled here in Middleborough, and is well known for um, the mills that he had on the Namaskat River at the site called Muddock. Judge Peter Oliver had several different mills, the ruins of which can still be seen at Oliver Mill Park. By the way, the one of the largest herring runs. Some of the artifacts we have here are things that um, came from the home that was the Oliver Mansion. The Oliver Mansion is no longer standing because Judge Peter Oliver is known for being a loyalist to the crown during the American Revolution. And as a result, uh, ended up leaving Middleborough, going back to England in exile, really, from here. And his very large, prominent, beautiful home that had uh, been a source of entertainment for the Adamses and the Franklins and uh, other personages of that time period, uh, was burnt to the ground. However, some things were saved from uh, the fire, including this card table um, and chairs, which are from Chippendales. We're now in the Cephas Thompson room. Cephas Thompson was an itinerant artist, portrait painter, very well known and prolific throughout uh, the East Coast during the 1800s. And uh, the paintings in this room um, were part of more than 700 portraits that we know Cephas Thompson did in his lifetime. The portraits that we see here are of two prominent Middleborough people, Colonel Elisha Tucker and his wife, Sarah Bourne, who were married in 1820. And that's the time period of these portraits. So they're kind of like wedding portraits. However, the cool thing is that we also happen to have pictures of them approximately 30 or so years later. There are other uh, portraits in here done of particularly members of his family. But um, among his children, there were three other um, artists, including Cephas Giovanni Thompson, who was known for uh, painting Nathaniel Hawthorne and um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, those paintings are on uh, in other museums, but uh, uh, they're 
remember it here. Cephas Thompson himself, the father, was known for known prominently for painting Chief Justice John Marshall. And prior to his being a um, portrait painter, he was also a sculptor of tombstones. And there are several dozen tombstones within the southeastern Massachusetts area that were carved by him. And these are pictures of some of them from Middleborough, Lakeville, and uh, Bridgewater. He learned the trade from his uncle, who was a Massachusetts State, State Senator, the Honorable Isaac Thompson. We do have changing exhibits, so there's, there's always something new each season for people to come and see. Um, this display here in the reception room is a changing exhibit area, and uh, this one is entitled Got Milk, and it looks at the dairy industries here in Middleborough from the past and up to the present time, including lowland farms in um, East Middleborough, which is the last dairy farm that we have here in town. Also, other changing areas um, for exhibits include in the Cephas Thompson Room display case. We currently have in one case, for example, images of who's who in Middleborough. We're now in Millhouse 2, which was a home for Peter Pierce's workers and um, single gentleman as well in one of the sections that we'll look at. The room that we're standing in was the living room of the home. Uh, we're referring to it now as the music room because we have uh, four examples of music from the time period of the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, a pump organ that belonged to Tom Thumb's family. It's a small parlor organ, but it's not a miniature. In addition, we have an Edison phonograph which was invented, first of all, as a dictaphone by Thomas Edison. And interestingly enough, one of the first people to have his voice recorded was P.T. Barnum in uh, 1890. We have an ad here from its time period that shows that it cost approximately $20. Um, the speaker is basically this thing here, <laughs> um, which is the horn. And the bigger the horn, the bigger the sound. Interestingly enough, in this room, which is a fairly good size, this horn is about as big as you want to deal with. <laughs> Another uh, unusual instrument that we have is a Regina music player, which basically works on the same principle as a music box. However, it plays copper discs, and each disc has is punched to flick the keys, and uh, one time around the disc plays the song once, there's a um, setting on here that you can adjust the tempo and another setting that you can um, have it continuous play until, of course, it runs down because it didn't run by electricity. <clears throat> but if you were sitting around in your living room, this is the kind of thing that you might have listened to. recently um, donated to us a fully functioning um, player piano which also includes a Victrola in one side of it as well which uh, we're, we will be looking at having repaired but the player piano itself works remarkably well and came along with three boxes of piano rolls as well. So we have a lot of selections, including a number of Christmas selections that we'll be putting together 
and playing at our Christmas open house, which will be in December. Also in this room, we have some examples of um, kinds of things that might have uh, been made during that time. Quilting, a quilt from uh, 1825 uh, from the Pickens family here in Middleborough uh, that was copied from a quilt at the New York Metropolitan Museum. We have samplers um, from the 1700s and 1800s, early 1800s as well, which was uh, something that young girls would have done in practicing their embroidery stitches and, and so forth. This is an area that uh, gives a nod to the Pierce Academy. The Pierce Academy was a very well-known private school uh, attended by students from all up and down the East Coast and from Europe as well. A residential school for many, the head of which uh, eventually went to become head of the zoology department at Brown University. As I said, it was a residential school. One of the things that we received not too long ago was this door. And it was a door from one of the boarding houses in downtown Middleborough. And this happens to be the bathroom door from the boys' boarding house with a lot of different signatures and basically graffiti from the 1860s, including some, uh, some limericks and some other items that are of great interest. Time for school. Here we are in the... The classroom here at the museum. We have examples of desks that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that had inkwells. The horn book was, uh, is featured here and shown it was basically where your lessons would take place. Well, nowadays, a lot of people use tablets for lessons, but tablets aren't new. This is the Chautauqua Industrial Art Desk, which was the tablet of the day because on this scroll, you had various lessons. You could learn your penmanship. You could learn music. You could learn art, history, science, all kinds of lessons that uh, took place on your tablet. We also uh, remember prominently in this room, um, Dorothy Fair, who was um, an MHA officer, guide, historian and teacher and friend who uh, passed away last year, um, who was uh, an educator here in Middleborough as well. And uh, we remember her very fondly and as a past president and someone who really helped the museum to, um, to stay alive through uh, a very long period of years and is greatly missed. Here we have our antique toy room, as you can see. Uh, a very large, wide display of a lot of different items, rocking horses, doll carriages, and um, Punch from Punch and Judy's in the corner over there, a handmade sled, and a number of handmade items, doll furniture, for example, that was handmade. This is one of my favorites is this tiny little printing press that has its own typeset drawer and you can make little cards and so forth with it as well. So that's something that I would have liked to get at Christmas time under the tree, that's for sure. Here we're in the Deborah Sampson military room, which honors all who serve. Uh, Deborah Sampson is our Massachusetts State heroine and was the first to be honorably discharged as a female from the Continental Army. She uh, attempted to sign, sign on um, here in Middleborough uh, as a soldier under the name of Timothy Thayer, dressing as a man. However, one uh, lady who was sitting nearby at the tavern said, that person holds their pen like Deborah Sampson. That's because Deborah had a damaged finger. And uh, that led to her undoing on that. But that didn't keep Deborah from uh, doing what she wanted to, which was to do her part for, for her new country. She went to Bellingham, later then went for training 
at their training ground uh, for the Continental Army in West Point, New York, and was involved in a number of skirmishes there. After practically two years of service, she um, came down with the fever and uh, it was discovered um, by the doctor um, what her gender was and he helped her to uh, recover in his own home uh, with his family and then helped her to uh, reveal her gender to her uh, commanding officer. She did receive an honorable discharge from the Army and later was the first to female to receive a military pension through the help of someone that we, you might have heard of. His name was Paul Revere, uh, who was a friend of Deborah's. Uh, Deborah was the first female lecturer in the country as well, uh, going around speaking about her experiences doing the Manual of Arms and, and so forth, uh, and uh, was uh, very well known throughout New England for that. So in her honor, also we look at uh, other uh, Middleborough people who have served in not only the Revolutionary War, but also the, the war between the states. Uh, we have cannonballs, for example, from Fort Sumter, where the Civil War um, began that was brought back, that were brought back by a um, citizen of Middleborough. We have a hat that looks like it might have belonged to Abraham Lincoln, however, it belonged to James Gammon, who was uh, from Middleborough. And a number of artifacts from the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, um, including the commander's chair from the J.A.R. Hall, um, the uh, mascot um, called Guardian, and say bald, a stuffed bald eagle that was their uh, mascot at uh, the J.A.R. And the Women's Relief Corps. The Women's Relief Corps was the auxiliary for the Grand Army of the Republic who uh, worked for women's suffrage, but also... Um, for the soldiers' home in Chelsea, Massachusetts, and raising funds for that. We uh, also remember here um, two Medal of Honor winners from Middleborough, uh, from World War I, Lieutenant Patrick Regan, who survived his service, and Wayne Caron, a Medal of Honor winner from the Vietnam War, who gave his life as an Army medic for in trying to save others. So very much so, gave his own life for others and is remembered here um, as well. Okay. Here in this section, we have a reproduction of the Colonel Peter Pierce General Store. And uh, many of the things are original to the store, including the counter, um, the grain bins, the cereal bins, the clerk's desk. He had four clerks, which meant it was uh, a very lucrative business. Um, grain bins, including for gram flour as well. And other things are examples from that time period of things that would have been sold in the store. And um, housewares, lighting items, foods, um, fruits and vegetables, coffee, tea, flour, spices, toys, medicines, Liquor in the basement, um, tobacco, basically the walnut of the day. However, what goes around comes around because when you went to this kind of store, you didn't go around and just take the stuff yourself. You spoke, you gave your order, and it was put together by the clerk uh, who wrote everything down, and you probably had it, and probably had it delivered to your house, or had to wait for it to have curbside pickup, if you want to call it that. Uh, so just as we see that coming back in today, it's, it's not new. Um, but we're very fortunate to have uh, these things from uh, the Pierce store, which ran from 1819 to 1933, started by Colonel Peter Pierce, who was a colonel in the War of 1812. Um, the store ran until 1933. Um, the last of the Pierces died in 1901, Thomas Sprout Pierce. Uh, from 1901 to 1933, it was actually run by the Pratt family. However, they kept the name uh, the Pierce Store. That building ran until 1933 when it became our police station, up until a couple of years ago. And uh, currently, where the town is looking at various options for reuse of that, that building. 
Also here in the Millhouse Village, we have a carriage house built here on site um, that is re resembles the carriage house that was part of the Pierce store. Uh, the oldest building that we have is the law office from uh, Judge Wilkes Witt, who was a Massachusetts State Senator and lawyer who also taught law in that office. That was moved here from its site at the corner of uh, Route 28 and uh, 105 um, when Fernandes Supermarket was built. And Mr. Fernandes agreed to move the law office by request of Lawrence Romain to the site and we are fortunate to have it today. Next door is the blacksmith shop built here on site where we have a blacksmith shop, wheelwright, a broom making machine that was just given to us um, a couple of years ago and we now grow broom corn to make brooms with. The oldest thing on our property is the Sprout Tavern outhouse. The Sprout Tavern was um, in East Middleborough and was uh, a very uh, well-known place. Um, we know that Benjamin Franklin visited the Sprout Tavern and that Deborah Sampson, our Massachusetts State heroine, worked as a weaver at the Sprout Tavern. Um, and um, that's a very high-end outhouse and that has real windows, a real door, plaster walls, and it's a five holder, three for adults and two for children. We're in another of uh, the seven buildings that we have in our Millhouse Village altogether. And this is the West Side Whistle House that was built in the uh, 1800s and was moved on site to here from Vine Street, corner of Vine Street and Main, May Street on the west side of town. In the Whistle House, we have two fire apparatus, an 1854 hand pumper that was used originally in New Bedford and Mattapoisett before coming here to Middleborough and being used here. A step up from that, of course, uh, came along later as we got motorized vehicles. And we have here a 1934 Maxim Motors pumper that was built here in town, right on the opposite corner over here at Maxim Motors. It's a great uh, thing for children to uh, have as a photo opportunity. We allow them to sit up on the, in the fire truck and uh, run the siren and ring the bell and so forth. So it's always a, one of the highlight experiences for, for kids. For the upcoming summer of uh, June through October is our season and we will be open from one through one to four on Saturday afternoons. We are available at other times by appointment. So if someone happens to have relatives, for example, who are visiting the area or a group that would like to come, um, particularly groups, it's often better to go at another time other than the Saturday one where we're, we're normally open. And we can arrange that by your contacting us through our email, uh, middleboroughmuseum at gmail.com, or our phone number, um, which is available also on our website, which is middleboroughhistoricalassociation.org, where you can find our contact information and information about the museum and upcoming events.